welcome everyone to session 12, the final session of um, what has been a fantastic two week virtual conference exploring the role of universities and UCL in particular in achieving the UN Sustainability Development Goals, the SDGs. And over the last two weeks, we've heard from some of the most insightful minds, both within the university, other universities, and in other organizations and agencies from around the world, um, sharing perspectives, ideas, innovative approaches to tackle some of the world's most pressing problems. And of course, that's the focus now is to how do we how, how do we coalesce those ideas into something for the future and a clear plan for guiding UCL in particular um, uh, for the next uh, short, medium and long term. Um, we've heard inspiring and insightful thoughts from our students and recent graduates who we often talk of as the future generation and of course um, as an educational establishment um, one of our core roles is actually to galvanize and 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 make use of that energy that uh, young people have for impacting on the future of our planet um, as we heard in session eight, many students already understand the critical nature of the challenges our world faces and, and already coming up with solutions and uh, creative ideas for that. So, but before we carry on with the discussion, which will focus around um, the chairs of each of the um, uh, 11 sessions to date, um, uh, it's a privilege to uh, allow us all to hear from uh, Michael Spence, who is the UCL's next provost and president. Um, a few words about the whole concept of SDGs and what he hopes we can learn from this conference. Michael Spence. Well, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you today and to be speaking to you from the lands of the Gamaragal people of the Eora Nation. I mention that for a couple of reasons. First, because I'm incredibly proud of having been born on Gamaragal land. Second, because we at the University of Sydney are very proud of the fact that people have been teaching and learning here in the Sydney Basin for tens of thousands of years. And third, because of course, the issues raised by the Sustainable Development Goals are particularly important for the first peoples of the world, for people who've experienced colonization everywhere. And so I pay my respects to the elders of the Gamaragal people, to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, the topics that you are discussing, it seems to me, are incredibly important, not just for UCL and for Britain, but for the world more generally. Um, we live in a claim saturated world and in a world in which populist pol politicians give simple solutions, simple answers to very complex problems. And it's never been more important to be able to harvest the intellectual resources of the university as a whole, and particularly a comprehensive university like UCL, to make sure that the work of the university, both in its teaching and research, is making a difference. And it seems to me that there are a couple of things that we have to get right. Um, first, we certainly need strong disciplines. You know, the epistemic power of the methodologies of the core disciplines remains. But the questions that the sustainable development goals raise are inevitably multidisciplinary. And so we need to be able to bring people together across the institution and beyond. And that involves a number of things. First of all, it involves a particular kind of cultural orientation that I've already seen in spades at UCL and that's very, very exciting to me. The second is, I think it involves structures and incentives built into the system that um, facilitate this kind of work and make it easier. And one of the questions that I'll be asking when I arrive in January is whether or not the settings are right at UCL for the kind of multidisciplinary work that we need to be doing. It also, of course, involves engaged research, um, research that makes sure it is um, not just studying the communities in which we live and the issues that they are facing, but working with the communities um, that, uh, th uh, that we're working, that, uh, that we live amongst and whom we serve, and making sure that we're answering questions that are important to them, and also that they are in one another, one way or another engaged in that research. And that is methodologically challenging, but I think incredibly exciting. <laughs> And it seems to me that it's not just um, the, 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 the nature of, of the research work we do, both in its multidisciplinary character and it's an engaged character that the sustainable development goals raise issues for. It's also questions of the dissemination of research and in particular, the way in which we see solutions put into action and the way in which we see policy discussions unfold. 
And that's tricky because we live in a Twitter world. We live in a world that enjoys the quick sound bite, that likes the easy solution. And academic work is inevitably nuanced. Academics are inevitably always saying, yes, but, and there's this other bit. Academics are always saying, but not quite. And so it's developing languages and approaches to engagement with the policy process that make sure that the work we do at the university really has impact in the communities of which we're a part. Well, all of that, of course, as things for which UCL is incredibly well known. And it was part of the appeal to me in um, applying for the position as president and provost. And so I'll be very excited to be joining you in January to think about how we can take this unbelievably important work forward, not just in our research, but across all our, the work of all our thought workers with our students as well, to make sure that UCL is really a place that is having impact, that is contributing to the solutions um, to the problems that the, um, that the world is finding at the moment most pressing. So I look forward to working with you in January. So thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we all enjoyed hearing some of the vision and thoughts of, of Michael, currently uh, president and provost, of course, at University of Sydney, but due to arrive um, uh, at UCL in the new year. Um, and to have his support for the sort of strands that we want to push through this conference um, and, and follow up is, of course, important um, and, and, and certainly gives a green light for us to um, uh, to be ambitious in our in our goals. So this final session is very much the opportunity for you all as the audience to start to contribute to um, to that future vision. We're, we're going to do this in two parts. So the theme for part one of our discussion um, um, is about SDGs through partnerships. And, and we'll focus on this angle and the importance of UCL working with partners to tackle these SDGs. Um, we're going to be, I'll be joined in this session by um, Monica Lackenpaul, uh, Susan Mickey, uh, Ijeoma Uchebu, and Saffron Woodcraft, who have been the chairs of the relevant sessions during this um, uh, during this conference, um, and we'll focus really very much on on them feeding back, giving some ideas that came out of their workshops and their sessions. Um, but of course, you're all welcome. Both both session leads from from the other sessions that are kind of coming come in part two are very welcome to contribute to this as well as of course the audience. And uh, will be your your questions will be fed through. Um, and uh, I'll be trying to moderate and uh, and getting some focus from our participants. So if we could start, really, um, the opportunity is there for um, for these individuals, the chairs of the sessions, to start to feed back. Um, why don't we start with um, um, Monica? Your session focused on positive partnerships around assistive technologies. What key lessons did you learn and where would you like to think um, uh, we should go in the future? Thank you very much, Dean, and, and thank you very much for the audience who joined us today. Um, when we started our journey in our session, we really thought about a different title, really, one which was about positive partnerships for the population and with the people, really bringing together this idea of this engagement, particularly with the communities, and putting them at the centre of what we do. And this led us on to talk about uh, the university and partnerships being a part of an ecosystem. And I really like that word about it, the whole um, idea being an eco ecosystem. And what are the ingredients about a positive partnership? We felt that at the current time, um, it's a time of change, but a time of opportunity, but it's also a critical time. And what this means for a university like ours is that we do have to be ready and prepared to bring about change and maybe change a few of the angles with which we do things. Um, the power of M was brought up a lot and that's the power of millenniums. How do we engage particularly with our undergraduates, our career researchers, they're the innovators, they have the thoughts, they have the ideas. So how in a powerful way do we bring all our students um, together to work in partnership with us at the senior levels as well? This is really a, a way of thinking about it as an inclusive way of approaching. We also felt that as a university, we are thought leaders. We can bring about change, we can influence, and we can be independent. And this means that we can actually mobilize people, facilitate, globally different partnerships. Um, and we should really use this influence in a very positive way. 
We talked a lot about the policy and practice side of things and the fact that we needed to think about the whole translational pathway, not just the research and the science at the beginning, but getting that into practice at the end. So if we want to do that, how can we best do that? And we thought of the media and we felt that one of the big partners um, that we have, that we really need to step up to working with a, a bit more is probably the media, traditional media and social media and making them true partners in this journey with us, within us. So many of these things came to, to head with us thinking, well, actually we also don't work so effectively with, uh, sorry, with, um, with industry, public-private partnerships. Sometimes we worry about private partnerships and sometimes we get a little bit nervous about it, but how can we bring public-private partnerships and the people together? And again, this is a journey we thought we should be taking forward. So we as the university are enablers, we are thought leaders, we are facilitators. And we had a lovely quote from one of my colleagues um, in the, in the um, session at the end. And she said, where no one gets rich, but everyone is richer. That's a consequence we want for our positive partnerships. So I hope that helps to really summarize some of the thoughts that we had in our session for you. Thanks, thanks, Monica. I, I'm, I, I'd just like to ask one question, just to, to, to um, which I'm sure will come up later. Um, and whilst we all appreciate the importance of those partnerships and relationships you've talked about um, in order to, to achieve impact, because that's really what universities should aim to do. Um, what do you think are incentives to do that that don't currently exist? Of course, all our academics and students are working and studying within a con constraint, um, within certain key performance indicators. Um, are they, do they fully represent the drivers for us to achieve those partnerships? So no, that's a very good point. And that's something that we really thought about is, you know, are, do the incentives have to be modified? It's not just about the quantity of publications that we actually produce, but it's about the impact we have. And we also thought about, it's not just about impact, but it's about reach as well. So we, you need reach to then have impact. The reach is through engaging with the public, engaging with policy, engaging with the media, and actually getting the word out about the work that we do. Of course, you have to have high quality research and that's why we're here, but a high quality research that sits on a shelf and doesn't actually bring any change in society is actually really very important, but actually isn't doing what we're really here to do. So one of the incentives would really be in all the way we address our researchers, thinking about maybe in our appraisals, how we're monitored, our, um, how we move up the ladder. Are we building partnerships? That takes time. And we should be allowed to have time to do that. It's not easy to build partnerships. You need skills and you need time. So how can we actually measure that in our appraisals? Instead of all the time talking about research papers, at the same time talking about what partnerships have been built. How have you worked in an interdisciplinary way? Those measures should be there as well. Great. Um, okay. Having, sorry, <laughs> thank Let's you. Make, let's leave it there because I'm sure we'll come back to this when when others have uh, other session leads have, have 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 presented and we can get that that that'll be a unified discussion. I'm sure. Can we move on to Susan, Susan Mickey, um, who was leading a session on behaviour and climate change? Um, what were what were the flavours? What was the flavour of your session? I think I have a couple of slides uh, to speak to. So if they could be put up, that was great. We um, didn't specifically discuss partnerships. So what I've done is pulled out a couple of themes that I think are relevant uh, to that. So the very first uh, point I think was really focusing on climate change. And this is maybe quite a big assertion, but saying that that is a threat amplifier for all other SDGs. Um, we looked at whose behavior and um, thought about citizens. They can change their own behavior but also that of governments and corporations. So for example, changing their consumption patterns can have knock-on effects on governments and corporations, but also lobbying and protesting. And thinking that we really need a systems approach. And I think we should think about this when we think about um, the partners that we form. Moving on. Uh, so uh, this is a well-known individual um, who I think very articulately said, and yes, we need a system change rather than individual change, but you cannot have one without the other. That was a theme that I think ran through our session. There's also a strong view of needing to engage all cultures and identities and ensure full inclusion if we're to alter behavior at individual community and government levels. 
Um, so I think that's something we do need to think about in our, in our partners. Um, are they being sufficiently inclusive? And we also thought that partnerships should be thought about in the broader sense of the word, including networks and alliances at all levels. Next. So um, thinking about bringing about um, behavior change. Uh, one. Uh, sorry, Susan, I, can, yeah. I think it's the next slide that we need to be on, am I, am I seeing? Yeah, 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 got it, well spotted. <laughs> um, kind of recognizing that the scale of the changes required are absolutely immense. And so words were used like transformation or paradigm shift. Uh, Dean used the word ambition. And I think that's something uh, to think about uh, in terms of going forward. And again, this is coming back to the idea of incentives, which I think is an important one, finding win, win, win uh, solutions. So um, often one can have things that are got health uh, benefits, economic benefits and consumption benefits. So examples of reducing meat consumption or shifting US travel from air to rail uh, transport. Um, that this uh, picture on the right illustrates. Um, and here's a kind of the government, corporations, individuals uh, intersecting uh, with each other and, and within those are the partners. And uh, leaving with a thought, no one can do it all, but everybody can do something. We can no longer wait for others to solve these problems for us. And so just two other uh, thoughts really to, to leave us with. Um, one is um, this issue about, on the one hand, the scale of what needs to be achieved is absolutely massive. And on the other hand, you have uh, an individual academic, maybe an early career researcher. How does that fit in uh, to the bigger picture? How can people feel that they um, can make a difference in terms of what they're doing at all stages of their career? The other thing I think is really important is to think about partnerships right at the beginning of the process within society about what research questions are being addressed, how are they being addressed, as well as who's going to address them, rather than everything being uh, driven by uh, funders and academics. Now, I know there's some thought being put into that, but as an institution, I think um, there's more we could probably do in thinking about uh, partnerships, not just all the way along the translational cycle from research into impact, but actually um, the beginning bit of how uh, ideas and um, passions and concerns and worries in society feed into the research in the first place. Thanks very much, Susan. And again, uh, just, a, just a brief question for clarification for a future uh, discussion. Um, where, where do you think universities fit? Um, in this in in this Venn diagram of yours, um, and do universities uh, universities are made up of individuals, of course, but they also have a culture, a behavioural culture themselves as an institution. Um, given we're talking about partnerships, where would you place universities in this, and 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 how would you want to to, to frame university behaviour? Really interesting question. I'd say it doesn't fit in there. I think this is really representing the really big global drivers relevant to the SDGs and um, singling these out. But of course, uh, universities are important and that's why uh, this conference is happening and why we're all here. So um, maybe a way of thinking about this is thinking about universities uh, sitting either above or below uh, these three Venn diagrams and thinking how we intersect with each of these um, to bring about impact. Okay, thanks, thanks, Susan. Um, now, if we can go on to Igioma, um, who was chairing a session about translational science. Thank you very much, Dean. We had such a brilliant time um, yesterday. We we assembled researchers from either end of the spectrum. So we had researchers from UCL working really closely with researchers from Lagos and in Rome. And so we, what we decided was to look at the partnership, but with the actors actually in the room. So we had people like Soji Ademuywa working with Patti Kotsova on a gamification app to reduce antibiotic um, prescribing. And this has been so successful that they've actually reduced antibiotic consumption in the hospital in Lagos. So a real example of a cross-border partnership 
that actually had a translational focus because the research ended up changing behavior and ended up helping patients because so much antibiotic wasn't consumed. So we showcased that kind of research. We had people coming from the biggest mobile phone provider, mobile phone services provider in the African continent. And actually he was looking at big data and how they could use this big data to track people's movements during this COVID-19 pandemic and show vulnerabilities when you had people all in high density areas. And so he was also on the call together with Del Miro, a U UCL academic, really focused on how you would use this very rich data set to actually help the government in Nigeria and help the people in Nigeria so the government could understand where the vulnerabilities were and where the overcrowding was. So that's an example of some of the things that we showcased. And then we started thinking about, well, it's great, of course we talk about translation, but how can we really make sure that it happens? And we came to the conclusion that you have to think about the translational aspect of your research from the very beginning. You can't tack it on on the end. So you have to think about your research question and then how are you going to achieve impact? What do you need to achieve impact? And we felt that what the university could focus on was making sure that people actually thought about this when they were um, um, crafting their research proposals. What's gonna be the impact? How are you gonna get there? What resources do you need? What support do you need? Uh, for us to do that, we, a lot of people talked about understanding the due diligence associated with finding a translational partner. So for example, the drug that I've developed, we found our translational partner by going to a particular meeting, meeting them and then doing some due diligence on them ourselves. But wouldn't it be great if the university could provide that because not everyone has the skills to do this due diligence. We had such a fantastic response from our audience. We had people coming in from many countries, Japan, Indonesia, Singapore, the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Georgia, so the US, so many different countries. And at the end of it, we asked them what they thought of the session and of course, a resounding majority of them felt it was excellent and some thought it was very good. What could we take home from the session? What we could take home from the session is that researchers want to do translational research, but they need a bit of help. They need a bit of help in that they need to be told to think about it from the beginning. They also need help when it comes to selecting a translational partner. And they need help with seed funding. You've got a great piece of technology, a great piece of research. You need to know whether it's gonna work in the real world with a little pilot study. They need seed funding for that pilot study. So when you're thinking about your strategy, think about encouraging people to think about translational research from the start. Think about helping them with the due diligence process. Someone actually said, I wish I'd had a lawyer to, uh, at the very beginning when I started the translational path. And then, finally think about offering seed funding so that people can actually test their ideas in the field before they start on this long translational journey. So thanks very much, Ajioma, and all sort of areas very close to my heart as, as well. Um, and I listened into sort of most of your, your session. It was, it was great. Um, it, it, in general, the, the flavor of it was UCL uh, to low middle income settings um, mm. in order to demonstrate impact. Um, and, and clearly there is a huge amount of impact that is required of our research there. My question is, does it always need to be one way? Um, and and can, can there be in effect, you know, a reverse flow of innovation to impact? Um, I, I often we assume, you know, um, uh, we in the North are giving, uh, giving, uh, giving, ideas to 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 uh, to people elsewhere but um we're in the midst of this covid pandemic and in fact you know the most well-off countries the countries with the best universities have fared worse of the whole thing and the public health and behavioral responses and collective nature of many much poorer societies have fared much better what do you think we learn from that in terms of this route to translation so that's brilliant because the key thing about these translational stories that were told is that they were actually co-created. So you take the app, the app could not have gone anywhere if participants did not believe it was worth their while. How was the app sold? The app was sold from the inside. 
So Soji sold it to his colleagues by saying, we do not have an antibiotics policy. If we're going to craft our own antibiotics policy, let's see if we can use this app to start off with. So actually it was co-designed, clearly co-designed. And then you talk about understanding what we can learn. I think that when you look at the person that came from MTN, the largest mobile phone provider on the African continent, and probably with more subscribers than anyone else in the world when it comes to mobile phone subscribers, what they were doing was using the big data to understand congestion, understand where people congregated. This is definitely something we can do. We can use that to understand why is it when we've got a local lockdown, we've still got lots and lots of transmission. MTN have used that data to understand where there is crowding. We can do the same too, instead of having this very blunt tool, we can start to use this kind of data on our own communities. So in actual fact, it's already going two ways. Right, right. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll move on to the last um, uh, speaker of this session, feeding back Saffron Woodcraft um, from a session uh, uh, that you led around inequalities, which of course are central to, um, to what we've just been talking about. So Saffron. Hi, afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so our session was uh, looking at the question of how um, COVID is, will and, and kind of should in the future. Uh, shape uh, global efforts to confront inequalities. So we had a fantastic uh, panel interdisciplinary working across a whole range of different geographies and issues. Um, but there are three uh, kind of headline takeaway points that I wanted to share today, which kind of ran through all of the different uh, discussions. Um, and these have kind of practical implications for um, UCL and for the kind of role of universities in thinking about SDG responses. And the first is that um, action has to focus on intersectional fault lines. Um, so COVID has clearly highlighted and exacerbated inequalities um, between the global north, global south, between cities, uh, really brought to the fore um, gender inequalities. So while COVID presents an extreme case, uh, what we discussed in the panel is that these inequalities just mirror and amplify pre-existing fault lines, essentially. So what we're seeing is inequalities that reflect the intersection of class and race, gender, age, and other identities. So in the context of action on the SDGs, uh, what we need to ask is how do we understand the goals through these intersections um, and then act accordingly to prioritize. Um, and this then, then connects to a second point which is around uh, the importance of place and local voices, which again has major implications for the way that we work um, as academics. So if we want to understand the intersections of poverty and health and climate change with race and gender, et cetera, we need to have more focus on participatory and uh, context specific forms of knowledge. Um, and I know at UCL and many other universities, we already have many academics working directly with different uh, community uh, groups, communities of place, patients, et cetera. Um, but we really felt in our panel that we need to go much further than that, that we need to challenge uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary ways of working and instead focus on transdisciplinary. So this is where the notion of different forms of knowledge uh, production partnership uh, was kind of explicit throughout all of the conversations. What we want are transdisciplinary partnerships, partnerships of equivalence, as my colleague Karen uh, Levy calls them. So we think about the way that we're working, not just with community members, uh, but bringing businesses, bringing policymakers directly into the uh, question of formulating research questions, designing and uh, conducting research, and then acting together so thinking together about how we then um, advocate, champion, uh, share that uh, knowledge. Um, so to do this in a meaningful way, as Susan has already identified, we've got to challenge from within the university, uh, the way that research is designed and specifically um, the way that these kinds of transdisciplinary partnership could be funded. Um, that's a major challenge. But lastly, um, on this point, I also would really like to see 
uh, uh, transdisciplinary principles brought into the way that faculties are configured. So we have community researchers working alongside, uh, working as members of faculty, so involved directly in teaching, um, um, as well as in the kind of community-based uh, research. And then the last point that ran through the discussions was around participation. Um, and participation not just being in the co-production of knowledge, but also thinking about what universities can do through different kinds of partnership to embed the ideas of participation also in governance, in policy, um, and in decision making. Um, and I think uh, to Ajima's point, there are some this raises some major questions about the way that we think about who we work with. Uh, within the university and different, more innovative kinds of um, intellectual partnerships being um, configured. Okay, well, that's uh, you've you've raised so many questions there. Um, you, you, like like um, uh, many of the others, have also um, highlighted interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity, um, transdisciplinarity, which uh, maybe another time we'll have time to, to dissect what the difference is. But we've all heard Michael Spence actually make it very clear that um, from a position of the sort of traditional disciplines, UCL should be moving towards uh, that. So maybe a question I asked to start with, Monica, but if I can ask you, Safran, you know, and then maybe get this discussion amongst you all about it, it, about what we need to change internally within UCL to actually ensure that we fulfill our own commitment internally to SDGs, but also actually put us in a better position to impact on, um, on, on improving the livelihoods of people around the world. So, so again, what, what are your thoughts about that incentivization or the specific changes that can happen within a university as large and as diverse as UCL. Maybe if you can just sort of give your views and we can ask others as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I do think uh, there is a question of, um, uh, there's first, first and foremost, there's a question of uh, purpose and partnership. So um, how we engage across disciplines around uh, collective kinds, collective visions of what academic research should be for, what the role of the university is in the 21st century. Um, I've spoken to various different colleagues within UCL um, around this already, but I think foremost there's a question about kind of purpose and partnership and how we can figure ourselves. And if we can develop that kind of dialogue around uh, what kind of neighbor, stakeholder, partner universities should be, um, and how we should then work with communities, whether they're communities of place or um, businesses, um, that I think might give us, might open up some different spaces for thinking about how we then configure ourselves around research questions and I think, and funding. So, so funding councils, uh, the way that, that research is currently funded, um, the way that impact is understood, um, I think are really major issues that need to be debated within the university before we can, can, before we can start thinking about well, how do we work with each other in practice? Because we're so confined otherwise by these structural um, issues um, that then prevent, you know, uh, what I see as scope for real innovation that then picks up on some of the issues that Susan were talking about and Ajima were talking about, about what, about how you value um, different kinds of knowledge, how you value and develop careers for early career researchers and the researchers of the future. Okay. Um, Susan, you want to come in? Yes. I mean, if I'm just thinking about uh, researchers, there's an issue about how, how researchers are valued. Um, somebody mentioned earlier on about uh, promotions, you know, how much weight is given to this in promotions, but also externally. I mean, usually when um, faculties or divisions have newsletters or LED displays, it's mainly about um, grants, big grants that people have got, um, or, you know, very high impact uh, publications. Um, no, nobody's ever celebrated the fact that um, I've uh, engaged in a pint of science or done soapbox science, uh, is standing on the pavements. I mean, this is, you know, public facing, but also all those range of partnerships, very rich partnerships we have. But the other thing I wanted to say was that um, I noticed 
I think, early on, that the biggest group of people attending this session now is from professional services. And not, it's not from just the academic part of uh, the university. And I think this is really important. Who is the university? Um, you know, researchers are only part of the university. And if we're going to um, attain the SDGs, uh, both as a university by being a showcase, but also the impact outside of the university, we should be partnering with each other, all the different kinds of staff groups um, within the university. So I kind of think we should have a think about that. Thanks, Susan. And Ijeoma, anything do you want to just add up on, on, on incentives to work in this way? Yes, I, I, I think that, you know, some people enjoy doing translational research because they don't want their research to die in a journal. And, uh, you know, they, they want to be remembered for doing something. But I think if you really want to encourage people to do translational research, people have to be celebrated when they have the wins. If people are celebrated quite publicly when they do so, when their research has impact, it'll encourage others to get involved. So I think celebrating people is quite important, but also telling the stories, going around and talking to researchers and saying, look, so-and-so also had this piece of research 10 years ago and look at what they're able to do now. And millions of people are benefiting from this and they're saving lives. So telling our impact stories is something we don't normally do. So telling the stories I think is, will be quite important and celebrating people when they have created impact from their work. This will encourage others to go into tra the translational path. Thanks. And then uh, just following on from uh, Susan, you talked about, you know, the broad array of, of people who work in the university. The university is a, is a um, you know, a community, a very large community. What are ways do you think that, um, or a question to all of you, that outside of just the pure research, but the ways in which we can work um, to, to fulfill sustainable goals, um, which can, of course, is many, many different uh, ways in which uh, 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 sort of issues there, but also our relationship with our local community that um, uh, because we are embedded in, in, a, in, a, in a community and within London. I, I mean, I think the sustainability team at UCL is a great place to start. Absolutely uh, superb, um, led by Richard Jackson. And they incorporate a huge number of um, different types of people in different parts of UCL. And the estates is an obvious, a huge one that uh, is very relevant to the SDGs. Plus they're developing alliances uh, with different aspects of the community um, around us, local government, um, industry, etc. So I think, um, you know, bringing them more mainstream um, and um, having an impact and an engagement. I know they do have pretty widespread, but just thinking about how can that get more engaged in what we were talking about earlier, uh, the types of uh, research and the whole translational pathway, I think would be a good start. So can any, I, so, I, sorry, I, uh, Joma and then Monica. I was just going to say quite quickly that to be honest, I, I like the question, Dean, and because we do not engage with our local community. So we all do a lot of research, but it, you know, do we do research that's going to impact on hungry children at the moment? Do we do research on inequality? The UK is, I think, the third most unequal country in the whole world. And what are we as researchers doing to, to influence policy? So there is a lot of um, work we could be doing on our doorstep even if it's just to highlight the problem so that the policymakers take note of the fact that we live in such an unequal society and what it does, what you've seen with COVID, COVID follows poverty, qu mapping quite nicely on poverty. And you know what? If poor people are dying more often, it means we're all gonna go into lockdown. So we are all going to suffer. We need to focus on the issues around us. And I, I love the question. I don't do it. I wish I did more of it. Thanks, Monica. Well, just picking up on that, um, most of our research program is about community partnerships and working in East London around nutrition and poverty. And I think what it shows is that actually there's quite a number of um, very creative uh, researchers co-creating with our local communities, and we probably don't know who they are. So I think there's some work to do internally within UCL to actually identify the people who are doing this work. There's a huge number of people doing interdisciplinary work, cross um, bi-directional work with low middle income countries. One of our pieces of work is looking at 
low middle income country innovations for um, feeding practices and bringing that to the UK to East London. Um, but I wanted to say really that our community is not separate to us. We talk about co-creation as though we're working with a community. We're, we're really embedded within our community and we need to work out how to make us part and parcel of the same ecosystem, as I said before. And we consider um, the way we work as embedded researchers. We like that term, co-researchers, embedded researchers. How can our community, and we use this model quite a bit in some of our child health research, how can our community become community facilitators, community champions, co-researchers with us, young people being co-researchers with, with us, designing the questions that you said, um, Susan, about what is it that the people want us to ask, and then designing and co-creating the actual um, research programs with them, not consulting, but as true partners right from the outset. And I think we have a great opportunity at UCL um, because we have so many disciplines and we have so many actors in this program that we could really work much more effectively. But we do have to go around our own university and seek out the people who are doing this work and, and create a family and an ecosystem together. Yeah, I just add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, this is where my points about transdisciplinary research come from. So the IDP works with uh, our neighbours in East London um, and in Camden. We use citizen social science methods. So we work directly with them. So they are uh, paid researchers, part of the team. They define the research questions. They help us conduct the research. They take charge of the data. Um, and the implications, uh, kind of working with policymakers through those implications. Um, and many of those methods and ideas um, we're applying in London and, and we have kind of adopted or adapted and learned from work that's going on um, in the global South. So when I talk about transdisciplinary, that's exactly the kind of uh, research uh, partnership, research kind of impact um, that I want to see. So I think, you know, there is an enormous amount of scope um, you know, across UCL to do that. But that requires, I think, stepping back, as uh, Susan said, a whole set of um, dialogues and structural changes. So how we think and talk about, um, you know, the production of knowledge, the way that those um, methods of research and uh, thinking about impact are embedded in our own uh, teaching as well as uh, research and, you know, developing um, and really amplifying a, a dialogue around what value to society those knowledge partners um, can bring. Great. No, 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 that these are these are really important points. We need to move on to the next group, but but the themes that are seem that, that, that are coming out of here here, which I'm sure will be replicated in future discussions, is um and, and there's a there's a lot of questions about this as well, is recognizing that we are as ourselves a community within UCL. We have responsibilities to um to organize ourselves in a way which also reflects our our wish to work with partnerships around the world, co-create transdisciplinarity. And I'm sure that'll be one of the goals for the follow up for from from this conference is how we start to measure um, uh, that. So um, if we timely to actually move on to the thank you all of you for contributing. It doesn't stop you. Please stay on. Doesn't stop you contributing the next bit. But but this part two of this um, of, of this sort of end of end of um, conference is. Um, it is focused on on universities and the SDG, so we can actually focus a little, bring bring this more into play. So, can I start with Martha McPherson, who was chair of session two, just feeding back from um, your session? Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, my name is Martha McPherson. I head up um, green economy and sustainable growth work at. UCL's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and it's been so interesting just to hear the last few minutes. Actually, reflection of getting embedded genuinely our local community because something we've just launched at the Institute um, is a renewal commission working closely with Camden, with our, the borough that UCL is in um, on post-COVID kind of economic renewal and generation, which is really a kind of one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning to go and kind of do this work that is really policy engagement um, and, and co-creation rather than translational research as, as has, been, has been discussed. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was really privileged uh, back uh, last week, last Tuesday, to host a really fantastic panel session two, which was very much about this question of universities and the SDGs. We had a panel with uh, panelists from Times Higher Ed, so we got stuck into some metrics questions. Um, we had um, members from the University of Sydney and the Indian Institute for Human Settlement. So we really 
uh, talked a lot about the, the kind of very uh, forward looking work being done by Sydney on the SDGs and also this question of universities in place and space as part of human settlement was kind of at the forefront. We also had Tanya Dunikova, who's one of our UCL uh, alumna, who's here in, in this meeting as well today. Um, and I think there's some really key takeaways for UCL, for UCL's forward looking um, SDG strategy. But I also think it's important to kind of start with a moment of thanks and reflection for having had this opportunity in the first place. Um, what Monica said early on about having what we really need is time to build our partnerships, have these discussions. Um, I think that really rings true with me. And I think we're all grateful to have this big two week period to do that. I also very much take the point being made by Michael Spence in the beginning, um, the length, the slowness, um, the, the carefulness of, of academic research. Um, it needs time to gestate when you come to talking about quite short term in some ways, goals like Agenda 30 and the SDGs um, and the catchphrases of academics, you know, um, we always say in economics, you know, it depends. We're famous for saying that. And I think the 90 minutes that we had on the topic of universities and the SDGs allow us to got in, get into some of those dependencies um, and the ins and outs of, of that work. So I think uh, conferences like this are probably the first thing that UCL should continue to do um, to make sure that we're, we're pushing our SDG strategy um, and uh, the kind of the work that UK universities and global universities can do on the SDGs. And so for my session, I'll start from where we ended because the session kind of reached something of a crescendo towards the end. We left the session playing around with the question of whether we've reached a tipping point, a turning point, a 1968 student rebellion point um, on the SDGs, whether students are forming kind of demand movement for better understanding, for better teaching, for better extracurricular education around the SDGs, of whether the COVID crisis has put us into this Overton window moment of demanding a new, new paradigm for radical innovation, um, both in the healthcare space and in others, um, and also whether the kind of um, the world of everyone suddenly remotely working can actually bring together these international global partnerships um, in a way that maybe we hadn't even realized we could do before. Um, whether kind of global engagement around climate and sustainability with the big movements going on in climate have reached new peaks as well. Um, so it was really interesting to kind of end on this big bu bubble of energy. And it really started off because um, we, th we threw out at the beginning of the session to the audience. We opened up by saying, okay, big conceptual thinking. What is the role of a university? What do you think of the roles of university and kind of crowdsourcing some of their opinions? And they came back with a myriad different things, everything from traditional education, from teaching, from research, as we've discussed. Um, from employers, so this point about uh, professional services, about wider services within universities um, really came out um, about innovation, about policy making, what is the role of the university? Um, and then we spent the last, uh, the kind of rest of the session, um, I think I'll share where we got to against the key, three key roles that we identified. Um, so firstly, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the role of universities as educators, um, the very maybe the earliest medieval universities were educators or researchers, um, and that today, sometimes within the SDG context, the education role can sometimes be overlooked. The SDGs aren't embedded in a kind of university-wide curriculum. They're embedded in some modules, um, but not, they're not seen necessarily as a source, um, a source text for what we teach. Um, and we can sometimes overlook as well the, uh, the level of engagement that has had in informal engagement. So uh, within the classroom, within the lecture hall, um, there's a lot of room to develop out work around the SDGs, but also separately. So in our extracurricular activities that we provide to students. Um, and there was a lot of discussion actually from the audience about what an SDG oriented curriculum might look like, what that might look like in university brochures and how that might be um, tested and, and, and kind of uh, measured through things like the Times Higher Ed um, metric. Um, and then the second, the second thing that's already, already been mentioned quite a lot, I think is really important to dwell on this idea that university campuses are embedded in place, in space, um, they are geographically uh, kind of large and dense, they take up a lot of room. Um, and I think that universities kind of are in themselves mini towns and we, the panel spent a lot of time talking about how we can assess the same kind of failings that a town might have, uh, same kind of sustainability failings that a town might have um, through using our, our universities as experimental living labs, trying and testing a few things in different parts of campuses. Um, and how can we learn from that and share that externally to our individual universities? Um, and then the last one, uh, the last kind of role we saw for universities was thinking about universities within a kind of global marketplace uh, of education, of, of training, um, and in an ecosystem of, of both global south universities and global north universities. And how do these actually genuinely engage with each other? Which we've spoken a lot um, earlier about, you know, how do you incentivize partnerships? How do you build out genuine, not lip service partnerships? Um, between these two different groups of institutions. 
um, how do you genuinely share knowledge? And one of the things we spent some time on was how, do, how can finance and how can funding actually support structurally ongoing relationships between delivery in Global North and Global South? And how do you, how do you continue to do this? And can, can our new kind of ways of working remotely help us with that? Those are kind of three key points. And then another one, um, the final point, the fourth point that came out of a discussion with the audience was, and, and a lot of our kind of Slido questions being brought out, the most upvoted Slido questions were about legitimacy, and about how does the how does society at large feel about universities? Are universities the correct um, kind of organizations to re represent, to reflect societal values like the SDGs? Um, because you know, universities are there were questions in the slide about the elitism of universities that they're seen as very removed um, from public discourse and, and even questions about uh, universities' own kind of governance abilities um, and some questions about kind of bureaucracy and, and legitimacy. So it was a really interesting destabilizing moment as well to have that fed back to us. Um, but yeah, so we had a big kind of big multifaceted discussion. I hope I've summed up some of it for you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, in the interest of time, we'll probably go ca carry on, but I just I wanted to throw out an re immediate response to, 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 to what you've said, which I think Doug, we do need to address um, um, maybe at the, once we've gone through everybody. Um, and that is that, that universities are increasingly developing a business model, financial planning, um, and that's uh, in the UK, that's by nature of the sort of, um, you know, the marketplace and the fee structure for students, and and I'm interested how how in that situation we not only incentivize our own staff and students to play more you know a bigger bigger roles, but actually what's the financial model of that? Because that's I'm sure what will in the end be uh, determine what what UCL wants to do. Um, and and so I I just throw that out for 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 maybe to come back to you at the end when we've been through 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 others. So can I move? On? Thank you very much for that feedback. Really interesting. Can I move on to Dan Osborne, um, who uh, your session was about sustainability and um, and the water cycle. Thanks. Thank you, Dean. And so I try and um, couch my feedback from this session in in terms that 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 uh, fit in with what we're discussing here this afternoon. And I think. Um, I would, would say that three or four things emerged. Um, one was um, the importance of communities in developing uh, solutions uh, around the sustainable development goals. Um, you, you can't kind of impose a solution. You need to um, co-create that, co-produce that with the community. That was one kind of major message and uh, I think that's something the universities can build on they're already doing some of that work um, but maybe they're not doing so much with their local communities themselves and so to their local communities they can appear rather isolated organizations and I think it will be very good to be able to address that point in UCL's future strategic position um, and I think that also, in a, in a way, means learning from the local communities where we are doing the research so that we can bring back, um, should we say, uh, to the home base, lessons from those communities we work with all around the world. Um, I think there is a role for the universities in challenging um, policy and operational positions in a, in, a, in a constructive way and, and pointing the finger perhaps where necessary. Um, and the example was given of where, where there was a, a globally, we delivered on um, uh, one of the Millennium Development Goals in terms of uh, uh, making fresh water resources, you know, possible water supplies available for people. So that seemed to be an achievement. But when you really looked into the information, um, you found that it, it was, most of that progress had been achieved in India and China. Uh, and so lots of the rest of the world was kind of still left behind. Um, so that kind of inquiry and that kind of challenge, I think, is, is very important. And that means, of course, the next point of, of engaging more with international initiatives. So I think that's something that needs to be done in this area. Um, and I think uh, from UCL's perspective, um, we're quite well positioned as an institution to 
make that international contact. But you know, that gives us three levels, if you like, to work through the local communities, um, those that we're in, those that we're working with, the national and regional organizations um, that are so uh, important um, and having a look at how things are actually going on the ground. And then what are the influence of uh, 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 influencing international initiatives we can be part of? And I think as well for university perspectives, there's a, another element of our activities that we perhaps have not paid enough uh, attention to because we're a bit comfortable with publications of putting our reports out um, into the public domain. And, and I've got in the back of my mind here, I, I'm editor in chief of, um, uh, of UCL Open Environment, a, a UCL press initiative. Um, and we're hoping there to be able to um, have some record of dialogue on research agendas addressing policy matters. And we're going to have a special series on, on, on water. Um, but by publishing in, a, in an open way, and not on paper, online with an open reviewing process and things of this kind, we hope we can see more dialogue around the research process and how that translates into impact and innovation. And, and so much of that process is rather hidden from public view at the moment. And, and so I think um, communities and individuals could, could miss out. And if you were to monitor what goes on with the SDGs, that kind of um, publishing process where we can have some dialogue um, rather than just a, a rather dead set of, uh, of stuff that, that, that the latest research soon marked moves past, we could do things like shining spotlights on the causes and reasons for inequality. Mm -hmm. I mean, every country in the world ha has got these inequality issues. Um, and if we are in the position we are in the UK and are very up, high up the inequality league, that is something we could use the home information to research more. One thing that I perhaps like to ask uh, uh, back across the, the, the panel really is, is to ask Susan as to whether a community has a behaviour, because it, it seems to me that in the COVID situation we've got, we can see behaviours of communities as being rather important in how these kinds of risks are, are managed. So quite a lot in, in that came out of the session I, I had the pleasure of chairing, Dean, and, um, and they were, they're just some of the headlines I, I, I've got in my mind at the moment. Great, thanks a lot. And if I can ask Susan just to hang on before answering that question um, about that, there was a, there's again loads of strands that came out of that, Dan. I mean, I I dipped into I think that meet that con uh, session and heard some exciting things about the local interaction with with Queen Mary. I think around water, yeah, around a, a network for London, yeah, absolutely, really, really. So so the local and and, and it's important. Just it, it reminds me that within UCL as sort of the, the emerging structures that have come out of the crisis management into sort of more thematic areas. I don't know if any, many of you have come across this sort of stratification between a focus on London, what are going to be the priorities, the priorities for the UCL engagement within the UK and, and e equally global um, uh, relationships. And I think obviously SDGs cover all of those areas. And I think this is an important strand. The other really interesting thing that you came up with, which I, again may come up later, uh, was linked to incentives, academic incentives. And are we moving away from the you know, high impact publication to something more about real impact um, um, oh, rather than just how many people read the journal. And it, it, I think there's interesting things that have come out of the COVID pandemic in terms of how academics have worked, which is shifting into that pre-publication, open publication, the sort of thing Paul Eris is very keen about. So there's a number of strands there, which I think all link in, even though you were talking about water. <laughs> so thank you very much. If, if I can move on to uh, Tanya uh, Dunikova. Um, to report back on um, on your session, uh, equally a very important session with regard to how we, uh, the community of UCL, respond. Tanya. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Tanya and I'm a recent UCL graduate. Um, obviously I'm coming at it from quite a different angle, well, hopefully not different, but different perspective. Um, so I think one of the really fantastic things about the session which I chaired was that it was um, a predominantly student-focused and student-led session. Um, that obviously ties into, you know, what other people have already said today, which is that 
the student voice, it, I think, is ever so important when it comes to all of these massive debates. And I think that it's also too easy to kind of talk about students without actually necessarily bringing their own voices to the fore and engaging them in these discussions um, and when it comes to decision making. Um, so I would also just like to say thank you so much to the whole team um, for actually getting me on board with this. It's been a real, real uh, privilege and hopefully I've contributed something um, somewhat interesting to the discussion. Um, so with regards to our session, it was about um, students, it was titled Students Beyond Boundaries. Um, and we had a, an incredible panel um, of different speakers from different backgrounds, uh, both recent graduates and current UCL students, um, all studying very different disciplines, which I think was uh, really interesting as well. And I'll go on to talk about that more later. Um, so some of the main talking points um, that we discussed were, firstly, um, how can we actually embed the SDGs both into the um, core, the core curriculum, but also when it comes to um, kind of extracurricular activities. Um, I think it was really, really promising and really exciting to hear about, you know, the sheer, the, the majority, sorry, the vastness um, and the variety of the different extracurricular activities that the students were involved in and how much initiative they were actually taking themselves to kind of challenge current university frameworks um, and to come up with initiatives, to come up with activities, whether it's students who are kind of more directly involved with sustainability, um, such as May, who was last year's sustainability officer, or students who sort of in no way have a direct link per se through their academic degree to sustainability, and yet are still going out of their way to kind of push boundaries, um, get involved, educate themselves, um, and work together with their teaching staff um, to kind of co-design their learning and co-design their curriculum. Um, I think also going back to what someone's already said today, you know, oh, sorry, and one of the top questions that we've had, which mentions how can we provide incentives and support for academics, I think it's also very important to consider um, how we can provide incentives and support to students as well when it comes to um, the SDGs, because I think, you know, as a kind of recent graduate myself, I think for me, when going through my degree, it's you're always so focused on kind of getting that academic recognition, coming out, getting your diploma, you know, being recognized in that way. But I think we really do need to question what are the incentives as a student to actually get involved in these things? Are these contributions actually being valued in any way? What is the incentive? Um, you know, I hate to bring it up, but obviously job hunting is also very, very relevant for us. And, you know, it's, it's difficult enough at any point, but especially during a pandemic, it's really quite impossible. So I think the question is, how can we incentivize people to get involved? How can we make them see the value of these sustainability initiatives? Um, and another uh, main point that we discussed was the fact that problem-based learning actually allows for greater uh, cross-disciplinarity or transdisciplinarity as well. Um, I think that it's very important to not only talk about transdisciplinary research, but also uh, teaching. So I'd just like to uh, shift the focus a bit to that. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest things that, came, that we came away from, from our discussions was the fact that uh, the pandemic obviously, you know, has been an extremely challenging time for us all, students included but there are also some positives and a lot of opportunities that have come out of it. And one of the things that the pandemic has allowed for is for some um, hierarchies in university context to break down. I think it's given students um, a lot of opportunities to communicate both with each other, but also um, with staff. So once again, it's a question of how can we make the most of this opportunity to communicate with each other, even if it is virtually, um, yeah to co-design our learning um, and to work out all of these questions. And then a final point was, um, again, there's a lot of crossover between what I'm saying and what Martha and everyone else has said. Um, how can we actually embed the SDGs, not only in the curriculum and these extracurricular initiatives, but in how the university operates and functions in and of itself. The university is not an island. It operates as part of a local community. Um, you know, I think one of the top uh, answer polls from earlier um, was saying that you know one of the main things university need to do universities need to do is work with the local communities. So how can we do that whilst actually giving students themselves a role as active citizens in these kind of towns? As I think was the term you used, Martha. You know, the, you know we need to look at universities as these small towns where students are citizens um, and they need to play a critical role. Um, and I think without getting the students on board, without getting them involved it's everything will fall apart because they are the voice of the future. And I think that if we don't educate students from kind of first year undergraduate level upwards, um, then really the university isn't fulfilling its role and it's not doing their job properly. 
Um, so I think that summarizes it all quite thank nicely. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think, um, uh, um, Sophie, did you want to add anything from that session briefly? Uh, only to say that I thought it was really brilliant. Um, it really showcased just how talented our student population is. People like Tanya, who can just go up there and practice those life skills that they come to university to get. And it was great to have the Slido pool capture the real value that students put on that side of education. And that really needs to be protected now more than ever. This informal learning that gives people life skills, knowledge, confidence, um, networks and you know people have been speaking a lot about engaged research and being a knowledge sharing platform bring the students on board with you and um, you know use them as well they're such an amazing resource so we're going to take it forward there's lots more we can do because there obviously are so many students um, but it was just a really wonderful thing to see and I'm very glad that we had Tanya that we had you on board with us. Thank you very much Sophie and, and Tanya and, and of course um, that um, that informal strength that you mentioned um uh, you know it'd be interesting at some point to, to explore with um with online learning rather than face-to-face -face learning what you know how, how how that negatively impacts on that but equally where there are opportunities there because clearly um this this i think we're, there'll be some areas of, of of the covid response which will become more normal in the future so we need to make make sure that we main, maintain a community um, feel and think about how best to do that. So thank you very much. Um, my, I, I, can I now go to to Anthony just to re re reflect back on the session that was just before this one? But I must say, as well, Anthony, I think this this whole conference was Anthony's idea um, uh, uh, more than a year ago, um, and coach has co chaired it with myself. So this is also to thank Anthony for all the. Um, all the work that's gone into it and all his leadership in this. Um, but but Anthony, do you want to just uh, feed back and also help take the discussion towards three o'clock where we, you know, which, when we end, which is about, you know, the next steps? Sorry, th thanks. Yeah, actually, I wanted to thank a lot of the people here because uh, I attended most of them. I missed Monica's, unfortunately, but I'll go back and watch it on online. The student one was great. Martha's one was great. Saffron. Um, Dan, I caught most of it. The uh, community one, I remember with Audrey and um, Paul Eakins. They were really fascinating and very compelling and got great opinions back. So, that, I mean, it's been really exciting, all of this. I want to come on to how we move forward, because I think that is a very key issue. Very quickly today, we had Sapatha Dasgupta, who's probably the world's leading economist on sustainability, who wrote an amazing report earlier this year that you should look at called The Economics of Biodiversity. And he talked about what inclusive wealth was and his wealth theorem that links any increase in social well-being increases your wealth. So bringing in a new dimension and not just focusing on GDP. Then we have Wendy Carlin, who has, is UCL economist who's transformed education of economics. And she talked about her three pronged, you know, markets, government and civil society, which was powerful and sort of color coded where different bits of economics would fit and said that inequality was always voted as the most important issue by all economic students. So they've changed the whole agenda there. We then had Kate uh, Jones talking about biodiversity measurement, links between biodiversity and infectious diseases, and especially the COVID pandemic, and why everything is a biodiversity issue. We had Carol Cadwallader from The Guardian Observer, who talked a lot about the threats the political threats from social media, from unregulated uh, platforms that can distort democracy and the like. And we had Ibrahim Abu Bakr talking about, particularly actually interestingly about race and the ways in which hierarchies and vulnerable people suffer in global health, in higher education, in all kinds of ways. And there was a fascinating discussion. I'm not going to go over all of that. But on the on the how question, I was presented with the issue that we're facing now about cross UCL participation in 2006, when I went to a meeting of 22 professors with the then Provost Malcolm Grant. And out of the 22 professors, I knew two of them vaguely. 
and it was they were all people related to health and we'd never really met and afterwards we we were asked to set up an institute a virtual institute for global health and i heard a lecture from a guy from harvard who came over and said he tried to set up a collaborative thing across harvard on aging and after two and a half years it was a complete failure because nobody really wanted to collaborate and they kept going around asking people to do things and they didn't do it. And what I picked up from him was that, first of all, you've got to uh, appeal to academic self-interest. And secondly, you've got to go around and uh, man manage by wandering around. You've got to get around the university and talk to people a lot and build trust. And then the third thing, you've got to link some finance to it and make sure that they benefit from it. And so for about 18 months, I and the, the administrator we had wandered around the university. And it was fascinating. I got to know people from all the faculties. It took a lot of time. But on, the, on that, we then had a project, which was the first Lancet Commission on Climate Change that we all worked on together with no money. And that has led on to a process that 12 years later is still very active. So I think building the trust and building the relationships first is very, very important. And one thing I was going to suggest, Ina, because I want to stop talking so that others can chip in, is we do need some coordination of this. If the objective of this whole conference is to move towards achieving the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and us being more creative, one, do we need to merge global engagement and global you know, research? Do we need to transform the grand challenges into an achieving SDG thing? So there are some structural issues there, but then how do we have some people that can do the kind of role that I did with Virtual Institute for Global Health and others? Do we need two or three people who are actually gonna spend their time going around constantly visiting different schools, different departments to find what's going on and try and link up people who they think would have similar shared interests and then think about how we're gonna raise money for this because there are opportunities. And I think UCL is a powerful university. It's in London, it's got the reach and uh, breadth and depth of, of our university that is unparalleled almost. So I think all of those questions arise, but we need a practical way of taking it forward because my my worry is that we'll have had all of this and then everyone goes back to, you know, day job. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anthony. And we, we've, uh, we, in fact, we've got 15 minutes actually where we can sort of, I'll, I'll read out some of the questions that are coming in. Um, can I encourage everyone who's listening to, um, and to, to, um, to respond on the poll, on the, the poll questions? Um, and I just I just remember, Anthony, you know, about this trying to get multidisciplinary, cross disciplinary work going. Uh, some of you know, I used to, I used to run a, a, a cross disciplinary health research institute in South Africa and trying to get social scientists and behaviorists through to epidemiologists and laboratory scientists. And when I asked somebody, I said, you've got to work with other disciplines. He says, I'm the most disciplined cross disciplinary person I, I know. I'm a virologist and I work with immunologists. That's what he said. And he said, that's as good, that's good enough for me. So it tells you, you know, everyone's in there in their small little island. And um, ultimately, uh, it seems to me that the best way to conjure up that real cross disciplinary um, environment is, um, is to focus on the questions. Because the questions can the, the questions are best answered. The big questions are best answered by bringing multiple disciplines together. So um, uh, I'm, I'm just um, Ijeoma, Why don't you you you've got your hand up? I'm not seeing everyone on my screen because I can't fit everyone and all the other bloody Slido things and so on. But 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 please go and I'll I'll come back with some questions that are coming on Slido while you're talking. I just, I just wanted to say, I really think that if we want to take this forward and really have a proper agenda, we would first of all need to put money on the table. Money on the table will allow people to coalesce into little groups to study particular problems. And then I think we also need to have a word with the funders. What we've seen is because of the inequalities in our country, we are actually suffering from this COVID shock a lot more than some of the other countries. And this would be this should be an impetus for them to really start studying or putting money forward 
for people to do this kind of research. We need to seed it from our end, talk to the funders so that once people have got some pump priming research data, they can then go to funders, funders will welcome them and they can get huge grants. And there also needs to be a translational piece in there because there's no point doing great research, as I've said, and nobody knows about it. Nobody knows the kind of research you're doing. And also it's not having an impact. So that's my opinion. Thanks. Um, there's, there's comments coming in, um, a few comments actually about publishing. Um, there's a question about how can publishers start to help us in developing a new agenda, um, which may be relatively new for UCL, but equally some pretty critical questions about, um, about page charges that, um, um, that are being uh, implemented by some of the journals. I see that, um, that uh, Nature is going open access, but is asking, is asking, you know, um, authors to contribute £10,000 or something, you know, absolutely disgraceful to, um, to, to allow publication. So clearly, there's a whole area about that of, 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 of our research being open, um, uh, being accessible, and being able to impact. Um, there are other questions, of course, about um, there's an interesting question that's come up in response to Anthony's uh, comment of, uh, of three men and a dog, it seemed to me, probably walking around UCL trying to conjure up, um, um, uh, conjure up money, saying that was successful in the end. And, uh, you know, we need to actually start to document the ways in which we can start to foster this, as well as structural issues. Um, Anthony also challenged um, challenged UCL to actually change some of the silos um, uh, uh, around um, around internal funding mechanisms. So uh, that's your comments on that would be um, would be would be very useful. Um, um, can I just come back to? There was a question that um, and that that came to Susan. If you're still around, Susan, um, with regard to. The cult, you know, again revisiting this. What is the behaviour of the institution towards this? So, um, can can you suggest some some key ways in which we can alter, we can we can change ourselves to be able to develop and then deliver those SDG goals? Tina, you know, was that to me? It was to you. Okay, it's just um, suddenly there's a lot of drilling outside. I had to put these earphones in, so I missed it. Um, well. One of the points I was making um, in the uh, behaviour session was thinking about behaviour in terms of the key influences on behaviour, which are um, capability, people's knowledge and skills, uh, but also that's not enough unless you have the motivation, but also you put those two things together and that's not enough if you don't also have the opportunities. So both the actually objective opportunities, but also the social opportunities. So I think that's one framework within which we can think about UCL, um, because that brings together the education, the training, the incentivization or persuasion, and then also uh, the, the financial material, but also social support. And all those things have to come together if we're gonna get any significant institution-wide uh, change. And also the other thing we haven't talked about is um, power. Institutions um, have power structures and it's really important to engage those um, who have most power um, as well as uh, people at every other part of the institution. But if you try and change the institution, leave those people behind, it's, uh, it's an uphill struggle. Thanks a lot, Susan. Monica, you want to come in about role models? Yeah, I think um, what's very important is that within UCL, um, we have um, great role models and great champions for this exact work. And I think what we do need to do is start um, identifying those role models, those thought leaders and those champions and actually creating that narrative we talked about earlier and presenting that narrative to others. And then if other people see that this work has a common goal, a common aim, something that's actually celebrated by UCL, others will slowly follow. Um, but I think it's, it's changing that balance to actually sort of find those people from the grassroots and bring them out. And I think that's UCL's um, really responsibility to try and do that. because we have some amazing champions and role models out there. And the final thing as well, as we've talked about grand challenges and we've talked about um, GEO, the Global Exchange Office, and, and I'm obviously part of that. 
Um, but what I think we're trying to do much more effectively now is bring together the student recruitment, alumni, philanthropy, GEO, grand challenges, again, all to one common goal so that we have one aim, one goal, and we harness all the expertise and um, knowledge that we have to change and build relationships. And fundamentally, it comes down to relationships and trust as well. And you have to have those cups of coffee, as I say, to actually change people's behavior and bring them on this journey with us. Thanks. Uh, if only a cup of coffee would change some people's behavior, I'd be very happy. But <laughs> I'm glad that you have more success than, than, than me. Um, we, we, there's, um, I should say at this stage that we have an, a number of initiatives already within UCL. We have a, a clearly underpinning this conference was um, an SDG strategy that's being developed in any case. Simon Knowles is leading that from, the, um, from David Price's office. Equally, there's a sustainability group uh, that Richard Jackson chairs, I think was mentioned early on. Um, and uh, it's my wish that we sort of bring those together, those initiatives together with this, with the outcome of this conference. And we actually focus very much on, on that whole thing of what is the strategy, what are we at, what are our aims for both in the next year, the next five years, the next 15 years. And that we then from that, we really to determine what the structure we need to deliver that, um, rather than trying to fit ourselves into what we've already inherited for many years past. So um, I think that is the process. And as I say, there will be, you know, um, th those who've chaired sessions are, are welcome to join, you know, a grouping that will emerge after this conference, but, but we'll aim to try and bring all that together, um, you know, and, and, and maybe Anthony, you can share that uh, group. But um, Martha, do you want to, uh, Martha, to talk about our external networks? But I think it's important that to, to I mean, clearly our external partnerships and networks are important, um, but in the context of specific goals towards SDG, um, a contribution to SDG and fulfilling SDGs. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think this idea of a, of a three man and a dog trotting around the UCL campus internally is very appealing. And I think maybe we also need to send three men and a dog kind of globe trotting as well to make sure that we've got these um, international links that we've been talking about, like translational research that is global as well. And yes, <laughs> three women and a dog, as someone was saying in the comments, and I completely agree. Three women, yes. Um, and something we've been looking at a lot recently um, uh, within IOPP and also uh, with GEO actually and other parts of, of UCL. Um, is looking at how other universities do this and the role of the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network that other universities kind of host there in I think there's about 30, between 30 and 40 different networks and different universities around the, around the world which draw on uh, national level knowledge and then kind of try to, to share and, and do peer learning between them. And we're looking in at the moment to how that kind of framework, whether we can scope it out within IFEP for UCL, um, and see how we can be both a convener and a catalyst to bring together other UK partners doing this work, both for UK outcomes and for international outcomes and get UCL to have this kind of strong seat at the table because the SDGs are, are here and now but what comes after the SDGs should UCL be part of what happens post agenda 2030 and how can we be part of shaping that long-term international research and impact agenda so yeah I think building up our international um, and global networks is a really exciting part of this. Can I, um, Anthony? Sorry just to follow up on Martha's point I think you know, we always think in terms of a university working upwards international government, but I think a, a, an international university like us can work also with supranational bodies. Obviously, there's the UN bodies, but, you know, there are the regional blocks, the European Union, the Africa Union, the, in, you know, the in, international parliamentary groups, um, all kinds of odd, you know, bodies that actually are quite influential because, they have the route into governments and stuff. And I, I, mean, I try and work with WHO quite a bit. For all its weaknesses, it does have links into every Ministry of Health in the world. So, you know, and I think if we think more strategically about that and find out where all the links are in UCL, because when you actually hunt for it, you, you discover that we've got a finger in the pie of everything. But, you know, if you look at someone like Mariana Mazzucato, she's really embedded in the European Union. And she has got a lot of influence there because she's talking to the right people. So thinking that through, I think, is really important. 
Thanks. Uh, um, a number of comments coming through supporting much of this and um, of, of, of the ideas. And I think, Anthony, that's a really important thing of where we've got to look at where UCL is really strong. Um, um, we can't, you know, we, we want to ensure that the quality of what we do towards these ends uh, is, is the highest. Um, and of course, even though we'd like to think we're superb in all areas of our work, it's not necessarily the case. I do want what, what I don't think there's been sufficient discussion coming back to students. Thanks, Sophie, just, just and, and Tanya. Um, I want to come back um, uh, to your ideas about students being real enablers and participants of this. It's often forgotten, but, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm continually amazed by um, uh, sort of stories of and, and my own personal experience of where students are willing to, you know, and want to get contribute well outside the realm of their own sort of formal didactic teaching. So can I just ask a little bit more about how, you know, how you would see students um, engaging in a new initiative that was um, that we're trying to move towards, which is a cross discipline, trying to encourage cross disciplinarity, trying to trying to get financial levers within UCL to support this, and and also we want to attract the best students. What is it that we can say that that, that about ourselves that is relatively unique for a student experience with regard to engagement with SDGs? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ian. I mean, I think. Going back to basics, I think it's obviously absolutely fantastic that we are having conferences like these, but the thing is, the sad reality is that if I'm being entirely honest, the vast majority of my friends will go through the entirety of their teaching experience at UCL and perhaps not even hear a mention of the SDGs, not even in any way be engaged with sustainability. And I think that as an institution, we need to first and foremost be stopping and thinking, you know, how is it possible that, for example, someone like a lawyer, future policymakers, how can they be going through a three or four year degree without ever, you know, getting involved in this, without ever hearing a mention of this? How is sustainability not one of the absolute key pillars that all of these different courses are kind of based in? So I think going forward, um, you know, going beyond what we discussed earlier, embedding the SDGs and all these activities, um, increased communication, collaboration, things like that. I think that we need to not to kind of use the cliche of the title again, but kind of go beyond the boundaries of the frameworks that we have right now, because I think that they're just not necessarily allowing for the transdisciplinarity that we want to get from our degrees as students. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, other things going forward, as I mentioned earlier, I think more incentive and more support for the student body when it comes to these things, more engagement, more collaboration, um, actually having the students involved in these discussions in these panels at every single level you know not just with these conferences but in every decision that will affect them both in the classroom and outside of it I think that would be fantastic because there is so much going on um, and I think you know going back to what you also said Anthony in terms of when you met all these academics and you're all working in the same field and actually you only knew two of them I can really say the same for the student experience I think it's there are so many exciting initiatives going on but actually, unless you're in that bubble, you don't necessarily hear about them at all. And once again, it's a sort of a question of us all prodding in the dark, trying to get something done. But if everyone could actually be sat down in the same room, which is partially what we've done with this conference, which I think has been so great, I just think that we could move forward so much faster. So I think as always, it comes back to, it comes back to that. Thank you very much. And Sophie, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um refer back to some of the conversations we had with the panel before the actual session, where we had some really clear, simple um, examples from um, Isha, I think it was, who said, just having won an award, um, I think it was sustainability award, maybe that was May, but just having more awards in the US, she studied in the US for a year, and she said they have much more like university based awards and projects, project prizes. And that's something that you can refer to in your first job interviews. And these are things which even in the Grand Challenges programme, we can easily set up. We can call students together to focus on one project. And the same with Lincoln, um, his whole business has come about from one project competition within UCL that went large and he won. Um, so these are things that we can do quite easily in the short term. Um, and then later on, as I said before, you know, we're in this new environment where we want to be helping people with those natural um, 
connections they form with their faculty and and Isha said what a great department she had in engineering that meant she could go up to her professors and say I've got this idea and they would help her and that's that beautiful relationship that people pay big money for um how we're we going to have to think about this but how do we replicate that and I'm hoping that you know we've we've had this great online conference we see that it can be done so we can create more of those to just bring people closer together and hope that they can um, I don't know, approach faculty more because I know we just said that it's great to create a narrative from, you know, the beacon people that are doing big things, but not every student is new to public speaking and has got experience in public speaking or approaching somebody or networking easily. And we need to serve all students, not just the real go getters that are natural leaders, I guess. Um, so that's just something I wanted to add there. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our time, actually, and, and uh, there's been a few other, just I'm summarising some messages that haven't got through. Um, one thing here, invest in SDGs and not look at it purely as a cost. Um, I think uh, I think we'll need to, whatever, whatever we come up with in terms of our strategy, um, I'm sure the questions will come up. Well, how are we going to pay for what we're going to do? What is the business case for it? Um, I'm sure the new president and provost is no different to any other president and provost in that in that respect. So I do think we need to consider cost. But of course, um, as we learned in the last session that Anthony talked about, you know, costs can be measured in many different ways uh, and, of course, impact as well. Um, so thank you all for participating. It was a really um, um, I'm pretty humbled to be able to sort of sum up um, what uh, this huge conference with 12 sessions, each of which has clearly generated not only a huge number of ideas, but engagement with uh, UCL community and beyond. Um, and it's important that we don't lose that momentum. Um, and that is why, um, you know, the offer has come for you all to be involved as we go forward and clearly, um, and I will certainly be taking that back through the Global Engagement Office um, and also Anthony through the um, Office of, um, uh, of Research, Vice President uh, OVPR, and, uh, and we'll get it onto the agenda of UCL for when the new provost comes. Clearly, there will be an engagement, a global engagement strategy um, that needs to be approved by uh, the new provost. And, and so this will be very much in there. But equally, SDGs are just as relevant to our population um, in Camden, in, in London, and the inequity we see within London and the UK as much as the world. So um, this does need to cross all aspects of our, our activity. Um, so I'd like to thank you all and say for your for your input into that. Um, uh, keep in touch with us through our email, which is beyond boundaries at ucl.ac.uk and our Twitter handle, uh, UCL underscore SDGs. A reminder that all conference sessions will be available on YouTube. So please do catch up and let others, your friends and family know about that. Um, and finally, a big thank you to everyone who's helped to organize this conference. It started off as a real, the plan for a real conference to transform it into something virtual, but still successful with many hundreds of people attending each session. I'm sure we'll get out the metric soon is testament to a fantastic team, um, both within the Global Engagement Office and also the Grand Challenges team. A lot of work behind the scenes to pull it together. Our IT support, thank you very much. And as I said earlier, thanks to Anthony um, for co-chairing the whole the whole conference with with me and uh, and <coughs> contributing to the original ideas uh, 18 months ago so with that thank you all very much we've captured all your comments and um, and uh, what a great uh, what a great conference thank you very much thanks Dean and Anthony bye bye